Welcome to another episode. And what are we doing? Are we going to have like, like, you know, the days of our lives in science? The sand like sand through, the through hourglass. hourglass. Yes. <laughs> With science. Yes. We are here to do This Week in Science. This is a podcast that we broadcast here live every Wednesday at 8 p.m. Pacific time. We broadcast live. Not everything ends up in the podcast in the final edit. Our goal is a tight 90, but that is rare. This, this, this thing in the distance that we aim for. <laughs> like minutes through the 90 minute timer. This is this week. In, like molecules through a pipette. This through is... Avogadro's number. <laughs> Yes, we are here to do this show. And we're so glad that you are here with us. Thank you for joining us. All three of us are back. Yes, Gord. Nice noticing. We are all here tonight. So this makes it all the more fun. We've mixed it up. Now it's ready to get back to the normal. Ready to go? Yeah. Yeah. Let's do this. Let's begin in three to this is twist this week in science episode number 871 recorded on wednesday april 13th 2022 can the internet handle this science i don't know if it can but i'm dr kiki and today we will fill your brains your heads no today we'll fill your head with brains leeches and heart but first Disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer. In the past, we have looked to the future, waiting around in present's past, planning and procrastinating, predicting and anticipating, all in expectation that one day the future would arrive. And wouldn't you know it, the future is here. In fact, the future might even be here ahead of schedule, because from the looks of it, we aren't ready for it. Case in point, an autonomous vehicle was pulled over this week. The vehicle had apparently failed to put on its lights while driving at night. The police approached the car, and it sped off, only to come to a stop a little further ahead in what the vehicle might have considered a safer location. When police approached the vehicle for a second time, they immediately lacked any protocol on how to proceed with the traffic stop. They couldn't demand a license or registration. They couldn't ask the car if it had been drinking or even ask it to roll down its window so that they could turn on its lights. They tried to open the door, but it was locked. In short, the future happened and nobody was prepared for it, making us look very much not like the people of the future, but people of the past who somehow stuck around too long. While there are plenty of examples of how stuck in the past we are as a planet, The oil economy, authoritarian autocracies, racial inequality, income inequality, gender inequality, matching socks, all relics of bygone eras. The future always happens this way. Nobody is ever ready for it. Not really. It just happens week by week, day by day, slowly and methodically, until before we know it, we find ourselves listening to yet another episode of This Week in Science. Coming up next. I got the kind of mind that can't get enough. I want to learn everything. I want to fill it all up with new discoveries that happen every day of the week. There's only one place to go to find the knowledge I seek. I want to know. to you kiki and blair and a good science to you too justin blair and everyone out there welcome to another episode of this week in science (laughs) i feel like going down like a friday the 13th rabbit hole but it's only wednesday the 13th so i guess you'll get a friday the 13th next month awesome 
problem. Okay. Yeah. I'll be, I'll, Look who's I'll tracking Friday that. the 13th. I just, I have just to knows. Use calendars a lot. I just learned these things. <laughs> oh, well. You know, I'm glad that you keep track of these things, Blair, so that we all know when we can look forward to Friday the and, 13th. And, and for the record, I think you're a very good witch. You're not like good. one of the bad ones. Yeah. Good, good, good. Are you a good witch or a bad witch? Witch. Or a sandwich. Or, or a sa no, you're an <laughs> Earl of Sandwich? I am so confused. Let's talk about We're science. still trying to get the sand through the minute hourglass <laughs> thing that you did that earlier. That was pretty good for your, your disclaimer. It was very of... apropos of our <laughs> sands through an hourglass conversation. <laughs> All right. The show tonight, we have science stories, lots of science news, as always, bringing you the good stuff. We have stories from me about plant protection in the rain, lightning life, and scientific skepticism. <clears throat> Might also talk about some baby brains. What do you have, Justin? I've got an abstract brain. Oh, good. Uh, yes. I, I Yes, uh, I would agree with that. Hang on, hang on, I'm loading. I see. I don't ever see my stories until right before uh, showtime, so I actually don't ever have any idea what I'm gonna be talking about. Okay, uh, let's see. I've oh gosh, hang on, hang on. I'm trying to get the, okay, I've got an abstract brain, energetic bacteria, ancient Chinese secrets, and getting high with space balloons. Sounds like a lot of fun. Blair, can you top that in the animal corner? Oh, man. I have blood-sucking leeches. Oh, <laughs> well, that'll do it. Uh, right. I have a pod of porpoises, and I have intelligent primates that aren't just us. Other oh, than that's what I was going to say. I yeah. mean, yeah. us, right? Obviously. Humans don't belong Humans in the animal don't. corner. Get them out of there. That's <laughs> what the oh, rest of the show is for. I think my abstract thinking story is going to have the opposite conclusion of your uh, animal corner story. <laughs> it's, no, it's kind of fun. Yeah, it's all linked together. It's all connected. It's all connected. It's all, connected. all right, as we jump into the show, I want you to connect with our podcast. If you haven't yet subscribed to us online, you can find us all places that podcasts are found. Look for this week in science in your favorite podcast platform. You can also find us on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitch. We do broadcast live 8 p.m. Pacific time on Wednesday evenings. Look for This Week in Science or Twist Science on Twitch. We're also Twist Science on Twitter and Instagram. If all this is too confusing, you can find the links, show notes, and so much more at twist.org. Let's get into the science that will break the internet. Okay. This week, this last week, two stories, two, not one, but two stories made me just go, ah. Uh, uh, oh, uh, oh no uh, oh geez oh gosh is it is it We're, bunk science or bunk reporting it's bunk reporting okay I mean, let's hear it if people are reporting in the if, if people are reading in the right places which are very science audience focused so really focused at people who are probably scientists then they're probably getting all the information but if you're grabbing stuff out of the headlines from the buzzfeed type list sickles mm -hmm. and that kind of stuff um it's not necessarily going to be giving you the accurate interpretation of what's going on so Two big stories out this week we need to look at with a little bit of skepticism and wait for more interpretation to come out. But yes, we can be excited about the stories as they're happening. Just be realistic, people. That's all. I just always. Can we just be realistic? Wait, 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 wait a second. What is the story? Don't don't okay. tell me that coffee actually doesn't cure cancer because this is uh, <laughs> I don't want to know that one. <laughs> no, no, that's not what I'm going to tell you about. Chocolate, today. chocolate isn't good for diabetes. Come on, Kiki. First, don't tell me the hard news. First, I want to talk about some heavy W bosons. These bosons have been investigated by Fermilab for quite some time, and they've got a massive massive uh, amount of data that they have been number uh, crunching to cry, try and figure out 
what's going on with the W boson. So we've got all these subatomic particles. And this out of Fermi is actually reported in the journal Science. So, uh, you know, Science, it's a very reputable journal. They've got data. It's not the final word yet. But so the W boson, it's got extra weight that was unexpected and could, based on all these analyses, could possibly mean that there's something wrong with the standard model of physics. So far, though, everything seems to be lining up in all the other experimental realms with the standard model of physics. So it would be a massive adjustment for us would to you... go, hey, oh, the W boson, it doesn't, it isn't the, the mass that we thought it was going to be. And that's what the data suggests from this particular study with a very high amount of statistical significance, mind you, mm -hmm. seven sigma, which is mm -hmm. really significant in terms of the way that physicists look at uh, their data. But there's another experiment at the Large Hadron Collider that has been measuring the W boson's mass, and it did not find data like this. It was only very, very slightly heavier than what was expected. So they just kind of, the the, the error that was involved would have it would have been fine. So now this Fermi lab experiment is like way away from what the Atlas experiment found back in 2017. And so there's a discrepancy between the experiments. There's a discrepancy between the data. Researchers, of course, are going to be going back now to the Atlas experiment, Large Hadron Collider data, and looking for more data, looking at, looking to find other subatomic particle deteriorations that might show these W bosons and give us more information as to whether or not they are deviating from what we expected. Well, so this is why replicability is so important, right? Because yeah. you could have consistent results over and over from the same source with yes. the same methodology, with the same researchers doing the experiment. And that sounds really good, but you have to then do that somewhere else with different instruments, with different people. And yep. that's where you start to go, okay, is there is there something wrong with my instrument? Is there some sort of confounding background noise I'm dealing with? It's, that's very interesting. And so the sensational headline was the, the standard models ruined, basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. this new okay. article has, it's breaking physics. Okay, physics is got broken. It, got it, got it, got it. Got it. <laughs> Hey, headlines, mm -hmm. physics, not, it's not broken. Uh, our physics, it still works very well. Um, but there is an interesting finding, very significant. Mm -hmm. Fermi Lab and the people who work in this collaboration, they also collaborate with Atlas people. And there's a whole lot of work going on. But, you know, there are people within the community who would really like to see this Fermi data stand up to scrutiny because it could potentially fill in some holes related to some other experiments that have been ongoing. So there's a, uh, a G2 experiment, the muon G2 anomaly, that also doesn't kind of fit with the standard model. Um, and this could potentially fix that? I, I don't know. So there are some explanations. What this means, though, is that right now there are physicists doing lots of theoretical calculating and writing papers, <laughs> coming up with a lot of ideas, and there's going to be more number crunching, more experimenting. Mm -hmm. It's not a final answer, and that is, you know, always where we want to be in science, right? It's not, we're in the process. We're yeah. in the process. The standard science model. is never done. No, and it would be kind of cool if something like supersymmetry finally had a bit of support. No, 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 please. No, no, no <laughs> oxygen to that, that room. None. Just everybody needs to like steer away when you're getting to choose which path you choose early on in your, in your life as a physics Jedi. Stay away from that. You please. choose. 
Well, it's not like well, the wait. physics Jedi. And I mean, this we're gonna mix like the Matrix and the Jedi. It's like which yeah, one do you choose? But the, uh, the, 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 what it sounds like too is it's like uh, an accuracy versus precision kind of a situation. Like, yeah, if you've got one lab that's like, hey, we can verify our results because we get the same result every time. That could just be that their instrument's very precise and it's looking at the same thing in the same way with every you know setting in the viewing yes. machinery or whatever and somebody else is getting a different result it could just be that that's how their equipment is set up so that could be the, the methodology of looking at it. it's always the thing with uh you're talking about reproducibility in science yeah it's also tough because different labs may be working with the different conditions completely even in an animal study the temperature of the room in one lab is kept high and it's kept low somewhere else so they're getting different results from the mice or whatever the thing is uh, so the, then you just have to figure out which one's actually accurate. Okay, we both have precise equipment that can monitor the, uh, can measure the same thing that the same way we've measured it before, but they don't match. So somebody's accuracy, actual is accuracy off. is off, and yeah. so that's when you've got to uh, delve into yeah. it. I figure. Yeah. Out so and I mean, we'll level, see. There's. This, there's fun stuff yeah, happening. It, it, the subatomic level, I don't even know how you begin to address <laughs> accuracy versus. I, uh, yeah, versus. I mean, this is all. I mean, we talk about subatomic particles, but really, what is being measured across the board is is energy, right? Is like the amount of energy at a certain uh, certain frequency, and so it's like, okay, we have this energetic signal here, this energetic signal here, this happening, and mm. so there's it's a bunch of inferring that's going on and so this w boson there may be another particle involved that we don't know about there could i mean it opens up all sorts of interesting possibilities but i don't know the case is not closed regardless physics isn't broken <laughs> no. you know you can tell things still drop <laughs> yeah, I mean, for the for the for the average not Joe, and, and gravity's working. I mean, my table is still for something now. I can't put my hand through unless I really now. Work on my kung fu. But that's the thing; we got to keep an eye on it. That's how we keep gravity working. That's right. So, keep an eye on it. As right? you keep stop, observing. You stop believing Permanent. in it. It's like fairies, right? No, not believing in it, it goes away. <laughs> That's right. Uh, oh my gosh. One week, day, one uh, day in the future, proved. people will stop believing in gravity and then things are just going to start floating off the planet randomly. The planets aren't going to stay in orbit around the sun anymore. And everybody's be like, what's going on? It's like, <gasps> we're having a problem with the lack of gravity. And then you'll have to do a movie and somebody will have to find Santa. And, and you'll have to clap for the fairies. Yeah. And there's a, that'll be the power meter. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> what about the dinosaurs? Yeah. Okay. So the second study that was a really, really big thing isn't even a published a study. So okay. the first story that we just talked about published in science, peer reviewed, real data, like it's, it's good. Okay. <sighs> this that has been making the rounds of all of the headlines and everyone's very excited about it. It's, it has to do with the Tannis fossil beds and justin do you remember the whole story about the uh the 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 upwelling that occurred after the dinosaur killing asteroid event that mm -hmm. pushed a whole bunch of water and mud and all sorts of stuff up to the dakotas and ended up in this tannis fossil site that is all this mishmash of like fish all over the place and these yeah. beads of the heated glass that are molten stuck in their glass tails. raining from the sky. Yeah. And so this story is like this wonderful, incredible, just you, this, this story that has so many details. These researchers yeah. have been really taking this site apart and finding all sorts of stuff. Well, they're, they have a documentary coming out with David Attenborough. And so there's marketing happening right now. And it's not, mm. there's no paper out. They've done a few papers that were peer reviewed, but what they are talking about right now is a dinosaur leg that was found. It's like a bird like dinosaur, an early ancestor of birds. Its leg 
no body, just a leg that was found in the correct orientation and no, it didn't look like anybody had eaten it. So it just looked like it had been ripped off of some poor ancient dinosaur and embedded in the sediment in the process of this incredible impact event that killed the dinosaurs. And so what they're saying is that this preserved leg is proof of all of this happening on this day. And this is a piece of evidence. It's a dinosaur who died on that day of impact. Mm -hmm. That's the thing I have an issue with and lots. And I'm, I'm not a paleontologist. I'm not an archeologist, but the pros have also said they had, they take issue with a lot of this because there are a lot of details that are still not fully understood and this is a media tour and it's a lot this whole thing has been science through media first and then the papers mm -hmm. after and it's yeah it's, it's, this is tough yeah. for me because so much of paleontology when you look at it it's like one little bone <laughs> The Quetzalcoatlus keeps coming to mind that like they found like one little piece of a wing and they're like, it's a giant pterodactyl. <laughs> like what? <laughs> so is, I know there's more science behind it. I, I know that it is way more complicated than that. But from the outside looking in, often I feel like it just looks like they get one little bone and they're like, all right, from this bone, we know it's an herbivore. We know how big it is. We know um, what the rest of his body looked like, right? So it's I could see how as a untrained reader being told mm -hmm. they found a leg and finding all this information from it tracks actually and so i could see how this could this could totally get out of control and uh people would believe it without understanding how specific all of that stuff has to be and how much other research goes on in the background to yeah. turn one bone into a fossil and into a story so it's, yeah, it's tough. <laughs> I don't know. I think it's a fun narrative, though. And, and they a, are doing storytelling. They're not doing science. They're doing, they're, you know, Yeah, uh, but I mean, they're doing, they're doing this. And that's the thing. The storytelling is awesome, but it they're putting it forward. They are doing science, but they're putting yeah. story before science as opposed to the other way around, where a lot of scientists, the majority of scientists, really make sure they have their details figured out before they go out and tell that story. They have Isn't peer that, review. They make a, sure that everything's sure been double checked. Going, you know, uh, and could this dinosaur have been there witnessing that day? Like, there'll be a slight caveat, and then you just go past and it'll be fine. <laughs> yeah, the very slight caveat, but the rest yeah. of it is going to be the storytelling, right? And that investigation and... I mean, I think it it is this particular surge deposit in uh, North Dakota in Montana. Like, it's amazing. Yeah, it's so full of stuff and the story. I mean, it's amazing that the forensics you're able to go through and get all this stuff. But now they're saying that they have a piece of the uh, they have a piece of the or pieces, evidence of the asteroid itself. They've got bits and pieces of it, which still hasn't been published. Um, they're talking about this dinosaur leg and how it is evidence of a, you know, this dinosaur is evidence, still hasn't been published. Um, there's a whole bunch of stuff that is still lacking that hasn't been peer reviewed, but that they have been traveling around. And unfortunately, I mean, I don't know if this is unfortunate or fortunate because they're taking the, they're giving talks, which scientists do all the time. However, uh, one of the researchers went to NASA Goddard Space Flight Center this last week. And a researcher who I know there, who's uh, a cosmologist, you know, she's like, oh my gosh, this is like the thing, this is it. And she's talking about how the, the emotional response of the scientists who were there, hearing the story and seeing these bits of evidence that were brought to Goddard. And I, I want to cry foul <laughs> because they are touring the evidence around before the mm -hmm. evidence has really been picked apart. 
And so that's that's all I'm going to say. So please, everyone, enjoy hmm. Dinosaurs, The Final Day with Sir David Attenborough yeah. on BBC One. It'll also be on Nova and on PBS in the uh, United States. But enjoy this story. But if you're watching this show, if you're listening to this podcast, please hear me and be skeptical. Don't just dive into the narrative and accept it all as fact because it hasn't all been published. I mean, this anyway. is ultimately the problem with trying to communicate science in the age of the internet. Yeah. Is that the internet and social media and all of it. Oh, the moves whole media so fast. environment. Yeah. You have the opportunity to reach people immediately, but science takes yeah. time to be done properly. And so there yeah. is a disconnect, yeah. right? So how do you get in front of misinformation? Um, how do you wait long enough to give the whole story without losing your moment? It's a lot of push polls. And especially, you know, in these cases, there was nobody trying to fight the science. But when yeah. when you are specifically dealing with mis intentional misinformation, how do you wait long enough to be correct, the most correct, while also battling misinformation? It's it's a huge problem that we're currently dealing with. And I, I don't have an answer other than to do it right. <laughs> that's what we try to do. So yeah. that's why I thought it was important to... Put on the skeptic hat at the beginning. I'm not, I don't consider, I'm a scientist, right? I don't consider myself just, just a skeptic. I'm a scientist, but you gotta, you gotta put on that scientific skepticism every once in a while. Enjoy the story. Enjoy the narrative, but grain of salt. <laughs> ah. Hey, uh, Kiki. Hey, What kind Justin. of science did you study? I studied brain science. Good, because that's going to come in handy because I have no idea what this next story is about. So, ah. uh, according, <laughs> to this, the, the, according to this, the human brain is organized into functional networks, which uh, is not something I was terribly aware of. It says uh, connected brain regions that communicate with each other through dedicated pathways are considered functional networks. This is, uh, we have one for senses, I guess, the motor system, how we move around. There's memory is involved in its own functional network. It says here the default mode network is the part of our connected brain that is responsible for abstract and self-directed thought. When we process external sensory information, the default network turns off. And when there's less going on outside of our bodies, when our senses aren't super engaged, it turns on. So I'm sort of thinking like, this is the part of your brain that's working when you're reading or meditating or contemplating, maybe, I don't know what to do with the rest of your existence. Uh, so the human default mode network engaged in rest and cognitive states, uh, such as self, the self-directed thoughts, so it sounds like a focused, thinky part of the brain. Right? Is that, is that a, would you would you support that uh, analogy? That it's yeah, a, focused, a very focused, thinky, thinky part. part of the brain. <laughs> thinky. Okay. <laughs> sure. Okay. So we got it's, this it's, focused. Yeah, it's, it's putting a whole bunch of different kinds of parts of the brain together. Yeah. So, and it's the part uh, I think uh, that in humans is giving us that sentient glint in our eye when we're doing nothing, when we're like staring at a book. But we still seem like we might be, you know, concentrating on it. Uh, question is, do animals have this ability? Based on cross-species comparison to the default mode network, thinky part of the brain, between humans and non-hominid primates, macaques, marmosets, and something called a mouse lemur, uh -huh. Researchers report Cute, finding major dissimilarities in connectivity files. Most importantly, the medial prefrontal cortex, which I'm assuming is a part of the brain, the medial <laughs> prefrontal cortex on the non-hominid hominoid primates is poorly engaged with the posterior cingulate cortex. Which is a quite a diversion from human brains where activity between medial prefrontal cortex and the posterior cingulate cortex is on fire. 
it is working when we're doing the thinky part of the brain and not engaging so much with the outside world. And this is uh, from an international collaboration across seven laboratories, five institutions, three countries, published in one journal, Cell Reports, led by Christos Constantinidis, the professor of biomedical engineering, neuroscience, and ophthalmology, who says, surprisingly, our results showed that in all species other than humans, the brain areas that comprise the default mode network involve two systems not strongly connected with each other. These regions, once responsible for suppression of external events and one for more cognitive tasks, appear to be linked only recently in evolution. It is this linkage that may have facilitated the capacity for abstract thought that led to the rapid evolution of human cognitive abilities. So this was an unexpected finding. They actually thought they would they would find uh, more of a, a archaic sort of blueprint for this uh, than they did. Unexpected findings change the way we think about brain networks. Atypical patterns of connectivity between brain areas are we have diagnoses for these. These are neurodevelopmental disorders, mental illnesses can be. Uh, attributed to lack of connectivity with uh, different parts of brain networks. And, you know, so they've got this. Now they understand that it's actually kind of unusual to have the connectivity in the first place for, for the humans. Uh, it might lead to future therapies or understanding how to treat uh, diseases going forward. So is this all based on the morphological presence or absence of a, a region or of the brain? Or were they looking at how the brain no. worked as well? They are looking at uh, how the brain worked uh, and, and how it was how it was interacting. They were looking at okay. pew, pew. Uh, right. not, probably not actually pewing, firing neurons, but uh, just what is it? Is it the uh, fMRIs? Is that the, when it's just general blood flow to a region? Yeah. And it's just like a picture. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. I'm just asking because <laughs> yeah, you don't I, like the I results. Totally, I know. No, no, no. I totally buy it. I mean, there's definitely stuff that we do that other animals don't. I get it. There's something special about our brain and I'm, I'm happy to have it. I'm just curious when, when you lack what you think is a very clear evolutionary progression of the brain, is it because as we know, when we damage our own brain, Brains can kind of reorganize and serve different functions in different ways when their different shapes or parts are missing or whatever. And so I could see how just by looking at what we currently have and what other animals currently have, you could miss how it changed when the brain enlarged, when new areas of the brain grew larger, and then it kind of reorganized and reformatted how it worked. So I think that's that's the part that I always kind of struggle with, with studies like this is that just mm. because it doesn't, it doesn't, it's not visually organized in the same way. Doesn't mean it's not doing the same thing. Yeah. And so this is about the connectivity between those, those regions. Uh, and, and less about, I think they don't, at least I didn't read anything that was talking about uh, shape or function beyond that, but looking for, for that. Uh, so the thing that occurred to me though, is, this requires this this network requires you to have downtime. Uh, evolutionarily yeah, speaking, <laughs> you need to be able to have this is internal thinking where you where you're actually sort of shutting out. This is almost like the flow mode a bit, right? Where you can like you're reading something, so somebody's talking and you didn't hear what they said because you were busy reading a thing. It's shutting off the senses. If you're a, a, a macaque or a, a mouse lemur. Maybe there's never a good time to do that. Maybe there is never a good time to really stop paying attention to the to the nature around you. Blair is Where not is agreeing you? with you. No, you're not. You think you think there's, there's so many reasons neighbors? why it's they live in large groups. So uh, there's they take turns looking out. There's lots of time to chill when they're sitting there um, and they're uh, grooming each other. They're spacing out. It's like a repetitive task. They're not really paying attention. Uh, also, any animal that's not foraging all day spends time just chilling, just 
just hanging out. It's that is a very common thing for animals to do. It's, or so you so they appear. Maybe they're always paying attention to their well, surroundings. Well, if you if you heard a scary sound while you were in the flow, as it were, you would you would kind of huh, right? And that's all they need to do is yeah, be alerted to yeah. specific stimuli. But yeah, apparently these they're, they're not. I mean, we may project that uh, <laughs> that a monkey is deep in thought where, while it's while it's grooming. Maybe they're just not. Maybe they're really they're not. Really not. They're not they're thinking about anything. Really not. <laughs> But, you know, perhaps things like planning. Whoa, what just happened there? <laughs> We're having a rave. <laughs> uh, you know, perhaps there are things like planning to steal somebody else's food or, you know, tasks that you're planning to do. These don't necessarily take the default mode network to achieve. And that the abstract thought that would be involved for uh, for other contextual thinking the abstract thinking you're talking about i think therefore i am kind of stuff mm -hmm. maybe that's what it's yeah, or just for. or just cave wall art where you're we're using symbols to communicate right. Uh, right. language yeah uh, well language yeah. is a tough one but but you're right about the the for sure certain art and stuff like that there's we don't yeah. really see that Hey, Blair, you want to mm. tell a story? Oh, yeah. Let me tell you about some blood-sucking leeches. Yeah. And how I've they're been waiting for this one. save the world. <laughs> this is a study out of Harvard University looking at DNA samples extracted from the blood meals of leeches. Um, they found that those DNA samples from leech blood, um, not actually the blood of the leeches, but the, the blood in the tummies of the leeches, um, that they could be used to find out which wild animals are, are present in a large protected area like national parks and that they can help establish leeches as surveillance instruments for animal uh -huh. conservation. Yes, I love this. And so um, they extracted from more than 30,000 leeches. They extracted DNA to survey over 80 species of vertebrates, including amphibians, mammals, birds, and squamates. That's a fancy word for reptile. And the leeches were collected over a three-month period by forest rangers throughout the 260-square-mile nature reserve in southern China. It's about 80 miles along the mountain ridge there. And um, leeches, they're abundant in tropical environments. So this works for tropical environments. We have to find something else for us temperate buddies. Um, but they they feed on a lot large range of animals, all the way from bears to mice, they are sit and wait parasites, I guess, predators. I don't know what you want to call them, but their sit and wait strategy means that pretty much wherever you collect the leech, if they carry the DNA of something, that thing was very close to where you picked up that leech. Those leeches are not moving very far. So, you know, they pretty much walked through or nearby that exact space where you picked up your leech. So that means your mapping can be very accurate. And they um, they digest the blood very, very slow. So they can also get the blood from leeches four months after they fed on that animal and test oh, the wow. DNA. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, that's a fantastic filter then. Yeah. And they, they were able to find near threatened and threatened animals via their DNA in the leech samples. So they were able to figure out where they were hanging out, like Asiatic black bears, tufted deer, stump-tailed macaques, types of frogs. But they also found livestock DNA, DNA from cows, sheep, goats. That means that the farmland right along the edge of the nature reserve, there was probably some uh, bleed over <laughs> um, where, get it, get it, where that means that um, the Livestock was either crossing into the reserve where they were not supposed to be, or that there was actually an overlap in resource use between the livestock and these, these threatened animals. So that could be a really good monitoring tool to figure out if farmland is encroaching on degrading habitat, protected habitat, 
or if it's impacting those populations. So long story short, this is just kind of a proof of concept that leeches could be used to map species distribution and that unexpectedly they found some really interesting insights just from this initial proof of concept. So there you go. Because they're 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 living they're ecological blood bags. Yes. They're doing the blood That's sampling, the DNA sampling yes. that researchers can't do. And then they they're are. sticking around right. wherever wherever they were. Yes. They're like, oh just... I'm full. Let me drop off. I'm Wild done. hypodermic needles just roaming free. <laughs> They're there. Oh. They're ready for you. These blood bags. So, uh, so yeah, this is something that that um, researchers could go out. It's way better than a camera trap or anything that you could find out from just general observation. Sound traps, any of those things are not going to be as effective as actual yeah. DNA from a leech. So, yeah, that's brilliant. Yeah. yeah, I'm trying to think if there are any other animals that could be potentially used in this way of course anything that sucks blood like mosquitoes, yeah, mosquitoes potentially but they fly, fly. But so they fly. anything the rain. That flies yeah, so they're too maneuverable then yeah. it's really it's a way harder to pinpoint where they came from so you'd have to find something yeah. that doesn't go very far like ticks ticks, ticks could good. work except yep. That they they do also move pretty far. So yeah, they can they're, travel. They're, yeah, like the leeches yeah, got to be in the water. Animals. They right. got to be the the animal has so to. What we need to do is introduce the... leeches to. No, 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 no. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> I don't even not, joke about it. <laughs> we're not introducing leeches to any environments where they're not already endemic. Yeah. But let's talk about life and where it where it belongs. Where it got its start. How it got its start. How is the big question. So we've talked, and anybody who has studied evolution or even chemistry has probably heard of the Miller and Urey experiment from 1952 in which chemists took a gas-filled flask and applied a spark of electricity meant to simulate lightning. And they came up came up with a whole bunch of molecules that are prebiotic in nature. They could have led to the evolution of life. There's a new study that has just been published that suggests that while that might still be part of the whole generation, the 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 electricity may have been involved in all of this, our understanding of the early atmosphere now is much different than what we used to think and where once upon a time we thought that the atmosphere was made up of methane and ammonia uh, and then it shifted things changed and more than 300 million years into the start of this earth uh, you had chemical, just the, the chemical interactions led to a change in the atmosphere that led to a predominance of nitrogen and carbon, as far as researchers are aware. And so thinking of it from that perspective, those molecules don't make lightning easy. It's not the same kind of environment, the same kind of atmosphere that you would have where it'd be like, yeah, methane and ammonia and lightning all the time. And there's just all these molecules getting started everywhere. And where you would just think there's this preponderance of life starting moments, potentially they were much rarer that the nitrogen, the researchers say, Christopher Cohn, a scientist at National Space Institute at the Technical University of Denmark said, the nitrogen and carbon rich atmosphere, you need stronger electric fields for a discharge to initiate. And so mm. uh, the atmosphere needed about, according to their models, 28% stronger electric field for streamers, which are the precursors for lightning, to discharge. Because these gas molecules are less likely to bump into each other and build up electrical charges that would lead to lightning strikes. So fewer strikes, fewer odds of prebiotic molecules getting their starts. Uh, so they were looking specifically at these 
these starting streamers and the probability of those and looking at that. And so now they're going to be starting to model whole lightning strikes, trying to couple that with early Earth atmospheric chemistry to give us a better idea of how prebiotic molecules that might have led to life came to be, which is pretty cool. And then on another note, even beyond the lightning, there has been um, evidence in rocks in Canada of life potentially starting sometime around 3.75 to 4.28 billion years ago. So long ago, but it was seriously, this nature paper that was published a, a couple of years ago suggested that it was really like the earth turned into a rock and then life started. Boom. Life <laughs> it's happened like, almost immediately. Immediately, right? And so the people said, well, these rocks, the structures, they may not have been really the, it might not have been life. It just could have been rocks. Could have been rock natural, things. natural formations that created the, what looked like a growth pattern thingy on there, something having been there, but could maybe not be a, a bacterial colony. Maybe it was. And scientists debated this. I don't remember who won. I know I was rooting for life, but I don't well, know who won. <laughs> I mean, life won. We're on the planet right now, which means life did win. Uh, life finds a way. But uh, there is now a new paper out in Science Advances investigating these bits of rock more closely. And so uh, they have taken really tiny, fine slices of these bits of rock and um, assess them to actually determine that they were as old as the old earth and not just some new inclusion in older rocks. Yes, indeed. They're super old rocks. These are over three, they're three to four billion years old. Um, so the rocks are the right age. And then additionally, they started looking into the structures within the rocks and they found in their CT scans and their really high uh, high resolution searching, they discovered that there were branches and like a like stem and branch patterns that were not the kind of thing that you would find from just chemical processes. And so they're finding more and more observational evidence of what looks like the kinds of structures that would be formed by microbial life, early microbial life. Additionally, the rock specimens and the, the molecules contained in them have molecules that seem that in their study, they say are pretty, they're pretty obviously metabolic leftovers, that they are the leftovers of life activity in these rocks. So fossils, old fossils in the rocks could be um and there there is more evidence it's been published so again hey everyone this is a cool story was life with those limited number of lightning strikes did it really get started that early the evidence is ah, it's tantalizing <laughs> but we don't know yet but it's very exciting yeah, and it it really this this sort of finding to to see uh, life this early or when it shows up later, which is still very early if you think about the uh, how old the planet is, the four ish billion years of the planet. This is it. This is pushing it beyond three billion years back. But then, even if it's only three billion, only if it's two and a half billion, it's still you know. For, for something that we think of as such a, a freak accident of, of nature uh, to come to exist. But if it isn't happening so quickly, then you can sort of see like with all the other planets that have the same chemical soup and the same physics that our planet has and the same interactions taking place it should happen there too. Yeah. There's no reason it wouldn't be happening all over the universe that life might be much, much more common than we have uh, assumed. Now, by common, of course, you have to still have somewhat Goldilocks-ish conditions. Of course. Perhaps. Yeah. Well, but that's perhaps. assuming you have the same uh, 
criteria for life to happen is the mm-hmm. only way. That's the other problem. Yeah. It's no, the, but we only have one example, and that's why I sure. For, but it's for, impo- for, it's it's really hard for me to believe there's not others. But that's that's not the point of this. I do want to say this picture. <laughs> I'm excited picture. about the James Webb though, because let's look at exoplanets yes. and find this out. Yeah. Right. Find okay. somebody what waving I, back. Um, no, this picture is amazing. There's just these little circles and squiggles, and that means maybe life. And yeah. I want to see a lecture from one of these scientists talking animatedly about these squiggles. <laughs> I want to tell me about what you see in these rocks. Yes, tell me why these squiggles are exciting to you because I know they're exciting, but to me, they just look like squiggles. I want to hear they look, they look like rocks, but yeah, these are maybe very special rocks and maybe they're the earliest life on the planet yeah. earlier than we even thought. The jury's still out, but let's keep figuring it out. All right, Justin, you have another story? Uh, yeah. Oh, I've got lots more stories. Oh, yeah, so maybe. This one is published in the Frontiers in Microbiology. Microbiologists from Raboud University have demonstrated that it is possible to make methane-consuming bacteria generate electricity. Oh, we have a very electric uh, show today. The bacteria Candidatus methanopterendens use methane to grow and naturally occur in waters anywhere from ditches to lakes. They might be there with the leeches. Just all over the place. Uh, according to microbiologist and author Cornelia Welt, in the current biogas installations, methane is produced by microorganisms and is subsequently burnt, which drives a turbine, thus generating power. Less than half of the biogas is converted into that power, and this is the maximum achievable capacity. We want to evaluate whether we can do this better using the microorganisms. So sort of skipping the whole burning and turbining part part and just going straight from organism to electricity uh of course it's in, uh it sounds like impossible right you can't just hook up they first of all they're so small the bacteria how were you even going to connect the cables and then this is a microbiologist helen uh Alboter, who says we uh, we create a kind of battery with two terminals where one of these is a biological terminal and the other is a chemical terminal. We grow the bacteria on one of the electrodes to which the bacteria donate electrons resulting from the conversion of methane. Through this approach, researchers managed to convert 31% of the methane into electricity, which is less than is achieved by the standard burning operations. But this is, of course, just the first time they've done this. So for a first run, it's an extremely good result. And they say they're going to focus on uh, improving the system. Also in their system, there's no burning of the methane. It's it's just, uh, look, oh, I love the, oh, look at that. Oh, that look, that's a real custom jobber there with those, uh, with those. uh, Oh, yeah. I mean, you said, where are they going to put the electrodes? Where are you going to, where are you going to hook it up? But I mean, it's a, it's a soup, right? It's a, it's a solution. The bacteria are just in solution. So it's like a jar Mm. of soup and you put the electrodes into the soup (laughs) and then you let the thing, let it go and let it do its thing. You have your cathode, your anode, you have your catalyst Mm -hmm. and you have your methanogenic archaebacteria that are like, I'm going to eat this up and suck up the methane and make electricity. I love it. I mean, and if you can uh, make them on, if they can make them more efficient and make them on a larger scale, then suddenly you have real power generation and it doesn't. And, and like you said, this proof of concept, this, you know, hmm. homemade jobby, <laughs> you know, it's like what they've put together in the lab out of a couple of, plastic jugs and bacteria and bits and pieces i mean you scale that up you make it more efficient and you put that into a a a plant that's producing methane you have 
I mean, there's well, I you put it into a bacteria powered car. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> You just stop at a red light and just go slosh, 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 <laughs> slosh, slosh. Yeah, no, we, we've been talking about <laughs> ginormous bioreactors, uh, right? but this is this is sort of the thing that uh, is is sustainable. You can turn half of your bacteria into a magnitude more bacteria overnight, or many magnitudes, perhaps. Like you, I mean, they, they you can just grow them off of basically. You know, sugar water and a couple mm -hmm. of trace elements. This yeah, is not so instead of the gas station, you're stopping at the sugar water station. Am I right? <laughs> yeah, exactly how it would work. And and the the you know, it's sort of funny too because it sounds like such a we have like all these steps in between. Like, oh yeah, we need this ancient forest, and then it needs to get covered up, and and then bacteria have to digest it and turn it into, and then you get oil or something there, or it turns into methane gas that can get pumped out. Uh, and then, so we're like waiting for like a millions of years for these bacteria to do the job. Well, we can just do it in real time. We can just do it just right there. Boom. Yeah. There's another, uh, not bacterial, but I think it's out of MIT published in nature this week, uh, what they're calling a thermophotovoltaic cell that's been created. It's like, they're saying it's, uh, more efficient than, the traditional steam turbine there's no moving parts and it's it's little it generates electricity from heat sources so black body radiation heat sources like the sun oh. um and it can uh -huh. uh, generate electricity from a heat source of between 1900 to 2400 degrees celsius which is the equivalent of up to about 4300 degrees fahrenheit super hot really really hot so they can uh potentially in incorporate this into solar setups um you know but any place that has white hot light where that's producing light basically white hot heat production um it can it can potentially get in there and it's about 35 to 40 percent efficient so mm -hmm. Sustainability. I think this is a huge point that we need that we need to keep pushing forward. These are the solutions. We are capable. We have technology. We just need to put them into action faster. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, we we could a hundred percent if if we pretended that uh, uh, gas was uh, was a was a resource. That was somehow finite or subject to uh, global events, and and uh, was an unstable thing on which to plan uh, economies. We could uh, perhaps invest in technologies that were manageable, sustainable, not destroying the planet so much. Oh, and, that doesn't sound boom reliable. bust enough for people's like dark tetrad well, traits. Right. And, and then and then part of the problem, of course, is is there's and it's something that I didn't even mention where they said, oh, the energy sector will find this very interesting. I had to, like, think about what they meant by the energy sector. Yeah, because there is. You know, there's there's bureaucrats in the world who are in charge of running a city and they might have a municipal power plant. And they're like, I just need the energy sector to provide energy for the people. And then there's like mining and logistics companies who are like, I don't care what you do with the oil. You can turn it into plastic. You can set, you can run your car on it. You can just you can just pour it into your rivers for all I care. As long as I got to mine it and deliver it and you bought it. I don't care. Like they're not really in the energy business and other energies are actually competition for their energy. They're their mining operations. So there's a there's a lot that we have to rethink in how energy is handled as a as a utility and not as a private business oh so many things so many things i i agree with you there but yeah there's so many things we need to consider in this way but oh blair can you can you tell us what our porpoise is oh yes the porpoise the of the story fly. is to tell you about a dolphin <laughs> And and why did 
Why did the dolphin put, make a bunch of clicking sounds? It was to find her porpoise. Oh. This is uh yeah. So this is this is a very specific anecdote anecdotal it's not even really a study. It's an anecdotal account that I want to tell you about um in the fit the Firth of Clyde, which is a saltwater inlet in the west coast of Scotland, and it's home to many harbor porpoises. And the locals found out one dolphin. They named the dolphin Kylie, and they noticed that she often spent time interacting with the porpoises. So, uh, some researchers from the University of Strathclyde, they took some hydrophones, Scottish, they dragged some hydrophones behind a yacht multiple times over the years 2016, 2017, and 2018. They normally dolphins make sounds by pushing air from their lungs through a structure that is called their monkey lips. It's a muscular structure that's similar to vocal cords in humans, and it creates the sound that we associate with dolphins, which is like putting air out of a balloon, a whistly sound. They can also make clicking sounds. They can do other things. Dolphins have a lot of sounds that they do, but their primary means of communication is the whistling. That's how they talk to one another. In listening to Kylie, she didn't whistle. She produced clicks similar to porpoise sounds. Hmm. As they continued to listen, they revealed a back and forth communication of sorts between Kylie and some of the porpoises. They would hear pausing in between clicks from the porpoises and Kylie. It sounds as though they were listening to one another and then responding. The problem is we don't know if she was making any sense. <laughs> we don't know if she was really speaking porpoise. We don't know if she was just kind of like mooing at a cow like we do. <laughs> or oh, if they funny. were actually <laughs> fully communicating. Yeah. Um, they were confident that she was attempting to communicate in some way with the porpoises, but they don't know if she's been successful. Yeah. Unfortunately, she has not been seen since 2018. So I don't know mm -hmm. what the deal with Kylie is. Either she's, you know, made it to the great blue yonder or okay. the great blue yonder. <laughs> we don't know. Um, if she shows back up, I'm sure these researchers will be jumping out on a boat with a hydrophone once again. But in the meantime, this is our first indication of porpoises and dolphins attempting to speak to one another. Which is pretty wild. How different are this they, is... really? They're very closely related. Yeah. Yeah. Very closely related. But and this is the, this have, is this, have, uh... have chimps and bonobos talk to each other? Right. Can we talk to chimps? Yeah. No. Yeah. yeah. So it's... Yeah. To, I mean, to some, to some trainable degree, we can, we can be trained to understand when they're hungry or when they're... I mean, I think, I but think there's you some level make of... But sounds back to them? That they could understand, and vice right. versa. Right, you could make they sound. Can't make human sounds. You could, to us, you could right. try to mimic, but it wouldn't necessarily mean right anything. And you and the, the closest thing yeah. I can think about is parrots. Right, they can make human sounds. There have been arguments that they understand what they're saying, but they don't really formulate full language connections. They, you know, they don't. They can't have a full back and forth conversation. Um, so it's, yeah, so it's, it's something that is kind of to this point unparalleled. That being said, it could be happening all over the animal kingdom and we just don't know because we don't speak the animal languages. <laughs> yeah. So it's possible that like rabbits are talking to mice and we don't even know, you know, it's <laughs> they're all, everybody's talking. It's just the humans that never, yeah. they just, they're humans so never figured hard to understand. Out. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, is Kylie? Is this the? Is this a dolphin? This harbor dolphin thing? Is this the one that I've seen like in a documentary or something before, where it's where it's hanging out and it, it's got like a golden retriever uh, that it hangs out with, and they go for swim. Is this like uh, the little town? I'm like not wasn't I'm, that a, a show from the seventies? Is it that old? Flipper. No, I'm not Flipper. talking about Flipper. Uh, it's not okay. Flipper. <laughs> no, this is in Florida in an aquarium. So. Oh no! Okay, so I thought because there was. <laughs> That's what I'm finding when I Google 
dolphin golden retriever. No, no, this was this was definitely this was somewhere where everyone had British accents and it was just it had like the same dolphin like hung out in this one bay and just was there all the time. And then they, you know, researchers would go out and swim with it. And then then it like had this dog that would come there all the time and they'd go swim around and hang out and play. Anyway, if it's not not finding anything. If it was the same, then I'm like, well, this this dolphin's always is used to interacting cross species because then it would have interacted with humans, dogs, and porpoises. But if it's not the same one, then yeah, no, this appears to have nothing to do with that. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> these are these are they're just friendly dolphins in the world. They're without curious. a porpoise. I would say friendly is a tough one, but I would say curious, curious. about their porpoise. Yes, exactly. For sure. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we are not curious about our porpoise because we know why we're here. We're here to talk about science. We're so glad that you're curious about science as well and that you're here to join in the conversation, to be a part of this program. Thank you for spending your time with us. If you are enjoying the show, please tell a friend, share twists with someone you love today. All right, we're going to come back right now to a part of the show. Oh, wait, it's not really much of a switch, actually. Yeah, we it's more just... of a continuation. <laughs> Continuing on. Uh, Continuing on. It was like an appetizer. On. It was an amuse-bouche. An am- yes, that's yes. A porpoise amuse-bouche. For Blair's Animal Corner. With Blair. She loves our creature, great and small. Five pigs, mill a pig, no pet at all. If you want to hear about animals, she's your girl. Except for giant pandas and squirrels. And a boat What you got, Blair? <sighs> I have chimps that know what you did. What? Uh oh. <laughs> If it involves. Chimps a... know what you did last summer. Yes. If it involves. <laughs> A chimp skull, then they might. <gasps> this is a study from Kyoto University looking at whether chimps can recognize chimp skulls. Chimps are known to interact with dead members of their species. They revisit corpses. They show mourning like behavior. We see this in other animals too, like elephants. But in this study, they tested chimpanzees' visual attention to a series of images of conspecific and non conspecific skulls, meaning chimp skulls and not chimp skulls. (laughs) They used images of faces, skulls, and skull-shaped stones representing four different species. And um, they found that the chimpanzees seem to know when a skull is chimpanzee-like. They relate this to the phenomenon of pareidolia. I even looked up how to pronounce that before the show, and I forgot. Pareidolia is... Yeah, pareidolia is when you see faces and things. I was just talking to someone about this the other day. But so they think that that's what this is about, is that the chimps can uh, analogize like the the shape and features of the skull to kind of picture a chimp face in their mind's eye. That's what they think is going on. Might be a little bit of a stretch, but whatever. Anyway, that's what this study decided to specifically look at. They conducted a series of three experiments using an eye tracker to map where the chimpanzees were looking and how long they looked at certain parts of the images not only do chimpanzees show preference for chimpanzee faces but they also show a bias towards chimpanzee skulls over other skulls they spent the majority of their time looking at the teeth which is interesting (laughs) this does not conclusively determine whether chimpanzees know that it is a chimpanzee skull but they they venture to speculate that when they find a skull they will likely be attentive to it like no other inanimate objects in their surroundings. And that might have something to do with the fact that it resembles their own and that it is, um, could be a symbol of danger, could be uh, a warning, could be just interesting because it looks like them. there's a million reasons that they might specifically focus on chimpanzee skulls. But based on this research, it looks like they do in fact differentiate chimpanzee skulls from other skulls. So they they looked at the chimpanzee skulls longer. 
Is that, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. So normally that's like a sign of novelty or something right. that, yeah. But of course but, it's also so, interest. It's attention. Right. <laughs> I'm putting interest, my attention, it's attention on this thing. And they are, yeah. they're drawing a parallel to the fact that chimpanzees mourn. So that's also kind of like lingering. Mm -hmm. So I do wonder because you said they spend a lot of time looking at the teeth. And so looking at, you know, the bones of a skull, you're not really seeing features of, you know, your friend, Bill, who's not yeah. around anymore. But his teeth, he he bared his teeth at you a bunch of times. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so you're like, oh, wait, those. Those canines, those, those canines have threatened me before. What? Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> maybe those look familiar. Yeah. yeah. But, but it wouldn't need to be familiar, of course. It would just be like that's a threat. If you're seeing yeah. uh, teeth, another chip's right. teeth, yeah, you're you're somebody's not happy uh, around you. Especially yeah. if you see yeah. all of them like that, then they must really be like, whoa. Well, so this this is it. why um, whenever you go to zoos. Or nature preserves where there are monkeys, but definitely apes. You're Show not supposed your to. You're supposed to cover your mouth. If you're smiling, oh. you're supposed to not smile big and and, and wide at them, because that is a sign of aggression. Saying, "Look at my weapons." And you know, everybody who goes to a zoo yeah. and they see the chimps, they see the apes, they're yeah. like. Look at them. They're so cute. And they're smiling yeah. and laughing and saying, hey, take a picture. Smile next to the chimpanzees. Which I'm sure an argument mm -hmm. could be made that the chimpanzees get habituated <laughs> to that. So like the apes sure. and zoos are probably yeah. used to seeing humans smiling and they're, they, it's, you know, it's not as big of a problem. But if you see a chimp smiling at you in the zoo, that means they feel threatened and they are showing yeah. aggression towards you. <laughs> so yeah. anyway. Um, so from skulls to hearts, Ooh, this, it really, this is of... like, like, I don't know. It's either, I don't know. This is a horror movie. This is yes. the, the primate horror films or Shakespeare or I, mm -hmm. I don't know. Edgar Allan Poe Ed, on yes. one hand. And then in the other hand is just uh, primate introspection. Know thyself. Oh, so we just philosophy. talked about knowing their own, the skull of their own species. I want to talk about knowing your own heartbeat. So this is a study out of UC Davis, and this is looking at rhesus macaques and if they are able to perceive their own heartbeats. Do you think without taking your pulse, you could recognize your own heartbeat? No. Mm, oh, recognize it? Yeah, uh, sometimes. Like if I've been exercising, yes. Yes. So I'm not so saying if I notice. I'm like saying exercise recognize. Even. Recognize. So both of you could, because you will recognize if your heart starts racing, yeah, if it's beating very hard, but also if humans in general, this is not even in the study, but I wanted to talk about it. Humans in general have a preference for a 60 beats per minute pace in music. And that yeah. is roughly the average human heart rate, the human heart rate. If you oh, have somewhere. music that is slightly faster or slightly lower, like if you have an 80 beats per minute rate in a song, like I learned this from playing music, if you're trying to keep time at 80 beats per minute, it is extremely difficult because your body either wants to speed it up or slow it down to get it close to in sync with or double time with the human heart. So you are aware of your own heart rate, right? Whether you realize it or not, it dictates things that you do and how you move and what you respond to. So my heart can't tell me what to do. It can. <laughs> the heart wants what it wants, Kiki. Okay, um, bye. But so, so this, so for this reason, I'm kind of throwing this whole study into question. But I, I we'll talk. Good. About it. Uh, so this episode's about about skepticism. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> <laughs> so they wanted to see if Reese's macaques could perceive their own heartbeats. There's reasoning for this beyond just, hey, are monkeys smart? It's because um, this is related to something called interoceptive awareness. Interoception is the self-monitoring of your physical systems. And interoception is something that humans do all the time unknowingly. That's why I was asking you about your heart rate. You're, you're actually paying attention to it, whether you realize it or not. 
Impaired intero interoceptive awareness is associated with anxiety, depression, mental health issues, and even potentially Alzheimer's. And so looking at what makes interoception happen, what animals have it and what animals don't, and how those systems are developed also then allows you to alter those systems and test subjects to be able to do research to help humans. So that's the background on this. Now, Reese's macaques, um, they, what they did is they monitored four of them. They sat them in front of an infrared eye tractor displaying stimuli. The stimuli bounced and generated a sound either synchronously with or asynchronously without the monkey's heartbeats. So uh, it was either faster or slower. So they did both of those. So they, so it wasn't favoring one or the other. And monkeys and human babies in other tests have looked longer at things they find surprising or unexpected, exactly what you mentioned, Kiki, before. So they will look longer at something unusual. All four monkeys spent more time looking at the out-of-rhythm stimuli compared to the in-rhythm. So they did sense an out-of-rhythm from their own heartbeats. This is consistent with um, similar studies with human infants. And so this is what they believe is the first behavioral evidence that rhesus monkeys have a human-like capacity to perceive their heartbeat and have an interoceptive sense. So they hope to use a similar model to study neurodegenerative diseases, including Alzheimer's, anxiety, and depression, and all sorts of um, emotional hindrances as well. So if they can measure interoception, they can track it as a behavioral biomarker to follow disease progression. So their next step is to study the mechanism that causes interoception, what in the body tells us what's going on with our heart, and what might be involved in psychiatric and neuropsychiatric conditions. What is is one, what, which one is causing the other? Is anxiety causing hindered interoception or is hindered interoception causing anxiety? And so um, you have to kind of answer all these other questions first. It's very interesting. The thing I push back on <laughs> is that um, I, it's hard for me to believe that this is not a basic animal thing that you know your heartbeat that I don't think this is so unusual to find it in, in monkeys. And I think if you look in other species, you will find them as well. And I think the issue is that like they rodents are just different enough that it would be hard to do these experiments on rodents. And, you know, as wonderful as rodents are for a model species that it just kind of wouldn't work the same way. <laughs> Um, but other species, I'm going to guess that we just haven't looked at them yet. We haven't checked mm -hmm. to see because it's relatively unstudied because we have this, you know, the human hubris of our own. We have our own internal environment and our internal lives. And yeah, of course, other animals can't be so complex. Well, it, think about any mammal, any placental mammal started out in a womb. And there was a maternal heart rate heartbeat happening all the time. When, yep. when you are taking milk as a baby, there is a maternal heart rate right next to your ear. And, and, and feeling the vibrations through your small, you know, chest cavity, mm -hmm. right? So your heart could, you know, sync up in some way with that maternal heartbeat. Yeah. yeah. So I think in terms of heart rates, I think we are very hardwired to recognize our heart rate, to have a preference for a steady heart rate. And evolutionarily, it's it's helpful to know when your heart is racing. Yeah. Also. And physiologically, yeah, yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Oh, I'm going to pass out or my heart yeah. is racing too much. This is too, you know, or maybe I need to get more excited. You know, there, there's, I'm, I'm gonna say that a lot of this interoception for the, you know, for humans, as well as for chimps, where if we sit and we think about it, we can go, yeah, okay. 
I'm aware of when my heart changes its speed. I know mm. when it's speeding up, when it's slowing down, when there are weird fibrillations, you know, people start to recognize those kinds of things once you become cued into it. But the rest of the time, we're probably very much like other primates in that and other animals in that it's unconscious, in that yeah. it's just a part of our body has this internal sense, but our, we're not thinking about it. Mm -hmm. Right. So, yeah, yeah but then and, and I think about I think about my own anxious childhood and anxious adulthood, oh. and how um, I for a long time was convinced I had asthma because I sometimes just couldn't breathe. And as an adult, I was like, "Oh no, that's anxiety." <laughs> so, as an adult, you recognize, "Oh, my heart's going really, really, really fast, and so I can't breathe, and I need to sit down, and I need to need to take deep breaths." But as a child, I was very bad at that, very bad at that. And so then you start to, then you can think, then you can start to extract this into a larger evolutionary question of, is that a human thing that we've developed back to Justin's original story about what makes humans special, right? Are we like, are we extra good at that? Or are we extra bad at that? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, know, the, that's right? like uh, a couple of weeks ago, I was talking about, uh, I don't know, a gazelle getting chased by a cheetah. Or something, right? And it, it gets away from the cheetah and then goes back to eating grass. Uh, like it, it's, you know, not saying an animal can't be traumatized, but the gazelle's kind of like, like if I got chased by a cheetah, I'd need some time to come back from my survival from being a, uh, chased by a cheetah nest. Gazelle goes right back to eating grass and doing whatever gazelles do when they're hopping around. The so, like, there is part of our brain. That, that communication from the amygdala to the prefrontal cortex that's like jamming information in that direction. We can think about it, but we can't really talk back to the amygdala to say, no, it's cool. There's no cheetahs chasing us anymore. We can relax because our brain is still in one of these other networks of activities that are going on, still thinking about it. Amygdala is still hearing about it, still thinking about uh, cheetahs. So... We have some we have some architecture that we've uh, allows us to do abstract thinking and be sentient and do all these wonderful things with our brains. And there's some stuff that was there for just being an animal and running from the uh, cheetahs or 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 chasing down prey that that's still there but isn't functioning. Yeah, and we don't necessarily. And and I think that's kind of. Yeah, part of it. We have this abstract modern society, and yet we have these very primal instincts, networks, things like interoception that aren't necessarily ne something that we need to be consciously aware of all the time that, you know, but that do help our survival and that do help uh, our, the management of our internal homeostasis. But I think it is, is, is what is it? Is somebody in the audience would know. Is, is it jungle that's 180 beats per minute? Probably is something it, like it, that. Yeah. It's like 180. Because that, the that techno, music the super is fast techno. Very soothing to me. Very soothing. And if it's actually if it's, triple If timing, it's 180, then that's it's like a, a multiple. Well, that totally yeah. makes sense. Then it totally fits in oh, the Oh, man. Blares. So I, I Googled <laughs> song 180 BPM, and they're mm -hmm. almost all on running playlists, which is very funny to me because trying to get your heat, heart rate up. Exactly. Yeah. And then get yeah. into flow, right? Yeah. Keep going, yeah. everybody. But I don't get think it, I, 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 I have this weird feeling like the reason I find that super fast music uh, relaxing now is that it's actually matching my heartbeat, which I, is not something that I would have. I think uh, you should considered. go see a doctor. Yeah, if no, that's no, true, but, you I mean, might be a hummingbird, actually. <laughs> no, if it's, a multiple a of, if it's a multiple of the 60 <laughs> is what I mean. Yeah, yeah um, exactly. Well, a triplet of the 60s is going to still be weird to your body. You want an you want an even division of it because yeah it's we we don't need to get into this completely it's fine <laughs> after don't show worry don't worry after about it. show but yeah I wonder also Everyone... then if, oh sorry <laughs> stop. this is this week in science and we thank you so much for joining us for another episode Justin where'd you go it's your turn after this section and 
I do want to say, if you really love this show and you want to help keep us going month after month, week after week, head over to twist.org and click on that Patreon link to choose your level of giving within our Patreon community. $10 and more per month. And we will thank you by name at the end of the show. Oh, and while you're over there at twist.org, click on the Zazzle link because we have some new goodies in the Zazzle store. You know you want a new pillow or mug or t-shirt. That's right. Support Twist. We thank you for all of your support. We really do. We can't do this without you. Where'd he go? I don't know. Do you just want to do your stories? I, no. I mean, does he not watch? Does he not look? At the, the, the rundown is like you. No, he doesn't look at the rundown. And then we, him. we asked him this recently and he said no. <laughs> it's, but always it's you and then him and then me. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Rachel. Okay. Yes, sure. I will do my stories. That sounds great. <laughs> that sounds fantastic. All right. So let me tell you about plants. I really do want to bring you some really interesting news about plants protecting themselves. So there are a couple of very interesting aspects of this story that I... I hadn't really considered previously that I get very excited about now that I have really thought about them. So plants, they have an immune system. Have you ever really considered the fact that plants have an immune system, Blair? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Right. All right. You've thought about plants having an immune system. Yeah, but system. that's because I think about them talking to each other too. I think about plants way more, I think, than the average person and, and their goings on. <laughs> Yeah, so you're thinking about the plants, you're thinking about, you know, what they're doing in their immune system, but how do plants know when to get their immune system going? How do they know when they need to fight off a pathogen? Is it after something has invaded them, you know, has gone past their cuticle, has gotten into their cells, they've been bitten, right? They've started to be eaten, their their defenses have been have been breached. Well, it's and the, so sometimes nearby plants will release chemical, chemical signals, right? Signals, yeah. But what about the rain? And this is where this story gets a little bit weird is that we don't really think about all the microbes that the rain contains. Yeah. Every raindrop. Ugh, every raindrop isn't just a clean drop of water. It has come from somewhere and is containing things, microbes that have been carried in the atmosphere and condensed into this droplet of water and have now dropped to earth, plummeted thanks to gravity. And then they land on a plant. And so then you have a microbe that could be bacteria, could be a fungus. And those little raindrops might get into a little nook or cranny and just kind of get in there. And like suddenly you have a fungus growing on a plant because it got moist and <gasps> the plant is just going to die. Right? No. Oh, no. 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 Of course not. It's healthy stuff. It's plant probiotics. Not. Yeah. Well, the plants have proactive systems in place. Researchers at Nagoya University publishing in Nature Communications about their work showed that structures on plants become activated by the droplets of rain themselves. And the plants then recognize rain as a risk factor for disease and oh, protect themselves. They're trichome cells. They're these little hairs on the outside of the plants get bounced and wiggled by raindrops as they hit the plants. And the trichomes play a role in sensing rain as a risk factor, and they activate immune responses. So the rain then, it activates these trichomes. The trichomes lead to increases in calcium concentrations in the cells, and the calcium concentrations change these G proteins and the signal cascades and all these things. And then these, you know, because of the calcium increases, the leaves are able to 
inactivate an immune suppressor molecule and get their immune system going. So they have this whole thing. It's like it's like the hairs on your arm standing up when you, you know, hear scratches on a on a chalkboard. Oh no, something bad's about to happen and then it's not your immune system necessarily, mm -hmm. but your fight or flight response is starting to get ready to go. Scary, something stimulated, but they are getting all built up to protect themselves <laughs> from the rain. Plants protect themselves from rain. Mm. And this just so, is wonderful yeah, to me. <laughs> this is interesting because uh, I was I was like thinking, oh, but the uh, the bacteria, they're probiotic bacteria. I mean, the plants need them. They thrive with these. Not and always. It, because, well, yeah, because, and this is the extrapolation from a previous study where they had done sterile water and put it on plants and collected rainwater and put it on plants. And the plants that got the rainwater did much better. Hmm. They grew better. They were healthier plants. Hmm. Um, and their their extrapolation is, you know, this is uh, likely because there's a probiotic effect for the plant uh, microflora that's on it. And that's that it's getting something that it doesn't get anywhere, which could be. But this is a mechanistic study, which is mm -hmm. then sort of saying that it's a like. Uh, uh, by activating, maybe it, it could be then also extrapolating, also speculating, because it could be the probiotic thing could be a thing, but it could also be that the the plant's immune system just getting woken up makes mm -hmm. it thrive better uh, yeah. for other. So yeah, it's it's, really... it's reminding me of the in a way of the dishwasher study, right? So if you if you have <laughs> your kid in a, in, a, in a very hermetically sealed home, then when they finally get exposed to things, they have problems with it. But if you if you let things get a little dirty, then you're exposing your child, then they're less likely to develop allergies. That's an allergy thing is a little different, but it's kind of like yeah. that, right? It's like sending your kid to school and, and letting them get exposed to other sicknesses as opposed to the last two years. And then you send your, your kid to school and they get sick <laughs> immediately, right? It's, this is yeah. what I was very afraid of is the second I took my mask off, I was going to get sick because I used to be sick all the time. And then I kind of like developed an immunity. And then it's, eh. so I, that, I'm wondering if that's what this is too, is it's like, it's, it's working the muscle of the immune system. It's, it's making them fight little bits of things off so that when the big stuff comes, they're, they're pumped. Right. And they're ready for it. Right. Could they're ready. Be. I don't know, but I just, I love how all these pieces come together. It's like, whoa, plant immune systems and they're protecting themselves from the rain and the rain is triggering it. And I will never think of the rain the same again. And then Justin, I did have to bring another story to kind of kind of uh, drop it back around to the uh, the brain networks and mm -hmm. a study that suggests that that babies it was on, on not baby monkeys but baby humans looking baby at people. newborn brains. Yeah, these functional. MRIs of baby brains. Researchers at Ohio State University have uh, just published in NeuroImage their fMRI scans of 267 newborn babies, most of which were less than a week old. So these babies wow. have had very little exposure to stuff outside the womb. And they were scanned for 15 minutes while they were asleep. So the default mode was not active. <laughs> they weren't they weren't engaging in abstract thought of any kind. But what's very interesting is that uh, we don't really know a lot about which networks, like you mentioned, there's motor networks and uh, sensory networks, and there's the default mode network. And, you know, from this particular study that you talked about earlier, Humans have this default mode network, which allows us to have abstract thought, not something that primate have, primates have, right? So what aspect of our brain development is genetic and what's there from the very beginning and what develops as a result of experience and exposure during our lives? Because we know that there's, you know, you're born and you have this massive explosion of growth of cells and dendrites and connections within the brain while you're growing. And then it gets pruned back and it gets all chop, 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 gets chopped, chopped and pruned. And then you have your adult 
brain and all the networks are there, but they're not all there from the very beginning. And this particular study showed that newborn brains have five of the seven brain areas that are found in adults. Newborn brains have active visual default mode networks, sensory motor, Mm. ventral attention, and high-level vision networks. They're there from within the first week of after being born, probably there from prior to that. But what this suggests is that there is, these are genetic. These are there from the get-go. This is human, right? This is, you know, this is all wired in to what's, start. That what are the other it, two? You what's, need it to start. The other what's networks. Missing? What's missing? The two that are missing are control networks and limbic networks. And these are associated with higher level functions and emotions. And so little babies have very little emotional control, yeah, <laughs> very little cognitive control. They're not controlling their thoughts. They're not controlling their emotions. Uh, and so those sense. networks aren't there. But while we know that babies don't really see well immediately upon birth and it takes several That's months what I was to get the at. eyes to actually to start working really they, it's they, yeah. the network the is distance there of their vision is very limited in the beginning yeah, they have it they the have the vision but it's you, you got to be right up there yeah but the but the network is there the brain mm-hmm. network is there and ready to go whereas humans we we really need to develop our emotional control and our cognitive control how we use our brain, how we think, how we how we control our ourselves in social situations, these don't come naturally. <laughs> so it's I think it's uh, really interesting. Also, what they're suggesting is that um, this these networks, there's a lot of variation. You know in the brains of the babies to start with, but all these networks are there. So there's individual variation, but then especially when it comes to things like emotion and cognition, cognitive control, those things, because they're independently experience-based, there's going to be much more variation between individuals and those can be affected by experience, by the environment during the life, the lifetime of the individual much more. Mm. Yeah. So anyway, really interesting looking at, you know, genes versus mm-hmm. environment, mm-hmm. you know, what's there to begin with versus what has to develop um, in humans. But the default mode network, it's there from the get Yeah, get-go. I love it. Abstract, abstract yeah, thinking Bambininis. Cool. Right there. Yeah. yeah. Well, but yeah. <laughs> they have the potential, <laughs> not necessarily having the potential to uh, control their emotions, but <laughs> potential. For it's abstract. tough. I get it. Yeah. yeah. All right, Justin, tell me a couple of stories. Let's wind this show up. All right. Uh, DNA, which uh, some of you may have heard of before. <clears throat> this is uh, from ancient human remains unearthed at the Bako Kiro cave in Bulgaria. They did some analysis uh, to see who some very ancient people were. I think these are, oh, God, they're like uh, many, many, many thousands of years old. It doesn't say it right here. I uh, think this is around, this is very ancient DNA, but uh, I'll have to look it up later. Uh, Study published in Genome Biology and Evolution found that they were more closely related to contemporary East Asians than contemporary Europeans. And I think these are like 40,000 year old remains. That's that's crazy. So this is in Bulgaria, <clears throat> population, <clears throat> ancient remains found in the cave, much more closely related to East Asians uh, today than they were to Europeans. So they tried to solve this uh, mystery. They were looking at the wider context of Eurasian Paleolithic human genomes. Study was led by Leonardo Bellini and Professor Luca Paganini. Pagani, sorry. We got Bellini in that. Uh, from the University of Padova, collaboration with some other folks. 
So the, the scenario the, the authors are putting forward is the populating of East and West Eurasia, so Europe versus you know, uh, China and Southeast Asia, that area, was done over several waves of expansion from a, from a, a single population hub. Now, what's interesting is they have no idea where this hub is. There's, there's a population, the, this hub of people that seem to keep reaching out into Europe. They find them reaching out into East Asia, usually unsuccessfully. So they, they, this is, okay. So while there were earlier Homo sapiens expansions more than 45,000 years ago, they all seemingly failed. There's only one representative of that migration that they've really found that is related to neither the modern Europeans nor the modern Asians. It's uh, somewhere in the Czech Republic. They found some uh, remains that, that weren't part of that. Uh, and they don't know how, how widespread that was. Then around 45,000 years ago, this is uh, quoting Leonardo Bellini. Around 45,000 years ago, a new expansion emanated from the hub and colonized a wide area spanning from Europe to East Asia and Oceania. So it just went everywhere and is associated with a mode of producing stone tools known as the initial Upper Paleolithic. So we've got the same kind of tool use all the way in Europe, all the way in uh, Oceania and, South, uh, and, and East Asia. And this, and it's genomically linked to these are the same people who are from the same pop, hub of population. So the fate of those settlers was then different in East Asia and Europe. Right? So the in Europe they endured for a while, and they all them. No, sorry, the other way around. The East Asia they endured, they survived. Uh, they led to modern day populations in East Asia. The European uh, shoot. They declined and then they pretty much disappeared and ended up. There's this one, this one that they found in Bako Kiro. And there's another one in Romania, I think, that they have that looks like it's also of this early peopling of Europe. Uh, but then they just failed. They just didn't make it. Uh, this is Julia Marchiani from the University of Bologna, uh, co authored the study. It is curious to note that this is around the same time the last Neanderthals went extinct. And it says, finally, one last expansion occurred sometime earlier than 38,000 years ago and recolonized Europe from that, again, same population hub, whose location, though, has yet to be clarified, uh, say the authors. So all, although even in Europe, there were occasional interactions with survivors of the previous waves, an extensive and generalized admixture between the two waves only took place in Siberia, where it gave rise to a peculiar ancestry known as ancestral North Eurasian, which is interesting. So now they're determining there are these different waves coming from this one population, and two of those waves meet, and they become ancestral North Eurasians, which uh, if you've been tracking the, some of the segments I've done on this show over the years, this is the population that is most closely linked to Native Americans and is thought to be the direct ancestors of the, the Tarim Basin mummies uh, in the Silk Road. So this, yeah. is, this is a mysterious... And it's still kind of interesting, too, because this population, I think the oldest representative that they have dated thus far is about 20,000 years ago. Which is still earlier than we have. We have uh, signs that there were folks in the Americas that are even older than that. So the, it looks like this population met somewhere in Siberia. These two waves of peoples leaving a mysterious hub that we don't know where they're originating. They leave. They go off. They evolve over some thousands of years. They meet up again, and then that. Ah, so anyway. Uh, it's a very fun find because it's sort of tying in together this one this one offshoot uh, dead ender that they found in in a cave in Bulgaria is sort of helping fill in the pieces of this mystery population of humans that's been going around the world. And last story today uh, to end our show, uh, part of the show, space balloons. But before I jump right into space balloons, telling you the whole story. Uh, we're going to cover the entire history of ballooning. 
So starting in, <laughs> yeah, starting in 1783, a French science teacher, Jean-Francois Pilatre de Rosier, made the world's first hot air balloon uh, and then launched it with a sheep, a duck, and a rooster on board. I did a report on him in my French class in college. Oh, nice. <laughs> so then you know it was successful. The balloon lofted high up into the air. Uh, it was up there for about 15 minutes, and then it gently crashed back to the ground. Two months later, that same uh, De Rosier uh, himself went up in a balloon. And this was a huge event. The King of France even showed up to watch this balloon launch. It was such a big deal. De Rosier managed a solid 25 minute ride this time. May have reached an altitude of 3,000 feet, which is really insanely high for, you know, there's the highest anyone had ever been on the planet. Uh, and then uh, an altitude. And then and then landed five miles away from where he started, which which might have been a little, you know, you're like, oh, hey, the king is there. It was like, he's going to shake my hand. But now you're five miles away and he's gone. Home. Uh, two years later, de Rosier died crossing the English Channel when his experimental hydrogen balloon exploded 30 minutes into the crossing. Hydrogen and so then, has a, a habit of doing that. Yeah, which he was a chemistry and physics teacher, so it's kind of surprising that he made that big of a mistake. That's that's pretty that's pretty bad design. So uh, because of that, though, pretty much the world forgot about ballooning for 154 years. There is a little bit here and there for 150 years, though. It's not no, nobody's uh, talking about balloons traveling and balloons to go anywhere. Uh, until it was used as passage back to Kansas in 1939 by the Wizard of Oz. So, so that may have inspired some people because people who were kids around that time, uh, you know, back in the if, if then in the 50s and 60s, the hot air ballooning sort of had another wave, and people started doing this recreationally. And there have been many firsts. There have been many uh, accomplishments. There's been crossing of the Atlantic and the Pacific Oceans and ballooning. But in terms of travel, it's really never caught on because the airplane came along. And that's way more efficient, uh, way more practical. So people just use airplanes for travel. And it's, it's the best way of traveling unless the only direction you're interested in is up. In which case, balloons have some advantages. Balloons have been considered, uh, and we were talking in the pre-show, I had a friend who was, who, they were looking at balloons, high altitude balloons that could be used as platforms to launch satellites. Because the further away you are from the surface of the earth, gravity is dropping off like by half by distance. And so you get up there and the amount of fuel you need to launch a rocket the rest of the way to put a satellite in orbit is significantly reduced just by taking a balloon up. Now, part of the problem with that, though, is the temperatures and the atmosphere. When you get up there, you're, you know, uh, unmanned, unmanned altitudes of 53 kilometers uh, have been achieved. Uh, you know, you can you can really get up there. So but now we got space tourism going on. So there's company there's a company that's eyeing ballooning for uh, space tourism is what they're calling it. Uh, with an offer to get kind of, of toward the edge of space, like as high as balloons will get us. So yeah, so depend, there's depending on who you ask. Uh, there's an international standard. There's a yeah. There's a, an American standard. It's anywhere from like eighty to a hundred uh, kilometers up. Yeah, you know, around fifty to fifty sixty miles, depending on what you're what you're looking at, is where they consider space is. And so a lot of a lot of these space tourism things are just kind of going up over that and then coming back down again in these in these rocket launches that are being done privately. Uh, this is not that high. This balloon is going to reach an altitude of 30 kilometers. So not quite spite, uh, space, but it's it's three times higher than a commercial airline flight is going to be, which is pretty significant. This is this is getting up. This is 
curvature of the earth in the distance. This is this is an amazing view. And they've got such a cool little pod here. So uh, there's a little luxury cabin, they're calling it. Uh, the company is Space Perspective. And they've, they've put out some pictures of this fancy cabin. It has one and a half meter tall windows, super comfy looking seats, complete with drink holders, a space lounge with bar, and the That's ability to wander important. around the cabin looking out windows in any direction. Uh, the flights uh, offer longer time at altitude than most. So it only climbs at 19 kilometers per hour. So it's about two hours up. Then you do two hours of just sort of hanging out, gliding, looking out the windows, hanging out at the bar. And then there's a two hour voyage back down. And it ends with, uh, with the adventure of an ocean splashdown. <laughs> that does sound like an adventure. That's, yeah, that's the way I put it. There, I, you're you muted. Know, what were you going to say? I, I was going to say I was pretty interested until right now. <laughs> like, yeah. That's I was very into it. I was like, oh, yeah, it's just like a giant elevator that goes really high. I would do that. It's like, oh, no. You're going to feel like you're falling at the end. Uh, well, it, it's 19 kilometers an hour. That's not, that's not too fast. I mean, I feel like faster than an elevator be, for sure. You won't ever get like zero gravity stuff going on with this. It's not going to no. be, it's not going to be a drop. You're not going to get dropped down to there. Right. Because it's going to be controlled down. because it's a balloon. Yeah. yeah. And yes. so unless something were to happen. Yeah. 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 Uh, so, but oh, we've got the picture of the cabin up here on the, for those watching that. It looks, that looks really cool. Looks fun. Like that, I would, I would be much easier, it'd be much easier to convince me to try that than going up on one of those firecrackers that they were putting people up on. <laughs> yeah. I don't know about, uh, yeah. Rockets are, they're, they're, they're explosive. There's, there's a lot of, yeah, it's uh, at 30 kilometers, and there's a, that's a great infographic there. Uh, that is above 99% of the atmosphere. Yeah, yeah. yeah so, I mean, it would be yeah. high enough that you'd really be getting out of yeah. a lot of the atmosphere. You'd be at the edge of the stratosphere and the, the mesosphere. You'd be, or, you, you know, you're getting up there. But, I mean, you'd see a lot. And people yeah. do, you know, go to the top of tall buildings all the time. And if you've got the money yeah. to do something like this, what a what a day, right? That would be you know, yeah, it's a, a weekend it's a full trip. on day trip. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I wanna I wanna make one addendum to your history of the balloon because I was like, Derosier, that doesn't sound right. the The word for hot air balloon in French is Montgolfier. And that's because he was the original person who invented nope. the balloon. So he no, invented no, it no. six months prior. So he, so he and his brother, the Montgolfier brothers, did their test on in June, and Derosier did their tests in his test in November. So, no. um, yeah. So at least Who's got the scoop. That's that's my understanding of the beginning. Because so, I was like, that's yeah, not what so, I remember from my report. So I looked it up. Uh, as I found. <laughs> So Moliere, okay. So Moliere, you learn uh, in a French minor. Right? Yeah, yeah. So Moliere, they, you're right. They did Mont design. Gauthier. Mont yeah. Gauthier did design. I think the balloon that might have blown up. Even uh, they were they designed uh, the uh, they built the balloons for uh, De Rosier, um, but they were actually the first to cross the English Channel in a balloon. So they do have some uh, some historical note too. Uh, but they were they were builders. I don't know that they invented or designed. I think that is still the uh, Ozier, but uh, they definitely worked together and uh, were on uh, at least a couple of flights, uh, balloon flights together. So they weren't well, in a competition. History books say different. <laughs> Okay. Let's, we, okay, everybody. There. <laughs> Homework assignment. Yeah. Yeah. Let's Blair, see. Justin, let's see right. I expect dueling reports next week. <laughs> okay, mine will be in French. So. <laughs> okay. Ça, so bon. Oh, maybe we can. J'aime beaucoup uh -huh. le français. Uh -huh. Oui. Uh -huh. Oui. C'est bien. C'est bien. Ah, oh, la science. Ah, did we do it? 
C'est fini. C'est fini. Ah. C'est le fin de le show. <laughs> We have come to the end of another show. Thanks for some great stories and great conversation there. That was a fun one. And everyone, thank you for joining us for another episode of This Week in Science. I do want to give the shout outs, shout outs to Fada. Thank you so much for doing show notes and show descriptions, social media. Really appreciate that. Identity4, thank you for recording the show. Gord, Arn Lore, others who help keep the chat room clean and happy and a nice place to be. Thank you for making that happen. Really appreciate your work. Oh, that's early. And <laughs> really appreciate your help. Um, and uh, Rachel, thank you for editing the show and for your additional assistance. And as always, thank you very much to our Patreon sponsors. Thank you to Teresa Smith, James Schofer, Richard Badge, Kent Northcote, Rick Loveman, Pierre Velazarb, Ralph E. Figueroa, John Ratnaswamy, Carl Kornfeld, Karen Tazi, Woody M.S., Chris Wozniak, Dave Bunn, Vegard Chefstad, Hal Snyder, Jonathan Stiles, a.k.a. Don Stylo, John Lee, Ali Coffin, Matty Perrin, Gaurav Sharma, Ragan, Don Mundus, Stephen Alberon, Daryl Myshak, Stu Pollock, Andrew Swanson, Fred S. 104, Sky Luke, Paul Ronovich, Kevin Reardon, Noodles Jack, Brian Carrington, Matt Bass, Sean and Neil Lamb, John McKee, Greg Riley, Mark Hessenflow, Gene Tellier, Steve Leesman, a.k.a. Zima, Ken Hayes, Howard Tan, Rich Christopher Rappin, Dana Pearson, Richard, Brendan Minish, Johnny Gridley, Remy Day, Flying Out, Christopher Dreyer, RTM, Greg Briggs, John Atwood, Rudy Garcia, Dave Wilkinson, Rodney Lewis, Paul, Philip Shane, Kurt Larson, Craig Landon, Mountain Sloth, Jim Trapo, Sue Doster, Jason Olds, Dave Neighbor, Eric Knapp, E.O., Kevin Parachan, Aaron Luthen, Steve DeBell, Bob Calder, Marjorie, Paul Disney, David Simmerly, Patrick Pecoraro, Tony Steele, and Jason Roberts. Thank you all for your support of Twist. And if you are interested in supporting Twist on Patreon, please head over to twist.org and click on the Patreon link on next week's show. We will be back Wednesday, 8 p.m. Pacific time, broadcasting live from our YouTube and Facebook channels, as well as from twist, twis.org slash live. Hey, do you want to listen to us as a podcast? Perhaps as you uh, fly your latest weather balloon, <laughs> just search for This Week in Science wherever podcasts are found. If you enjoyed the show, get your friends to subscribe as well. For more information on anything you've heard here today, uh, show notes as well as links to stories are available on our website, www.twist.org. And you can sign up for a newsletter. You can also contact us directly. Email Kirsten at Kirsten at thisweekinscience.com, Justin at twistminion at gmail.com, or me, Blair, at blairbaz at twist.org. Just be sure to put twist, T-W-I-S, in the subject line, or your email will no longer have a porpoise, and it'll be absorbed by a pot of dolphins. Oh, oh. that was a good one. Uh, you can uh, chirp at us there at the uh, Twitter, if you like, where we are at Twist Science, at Dr. Kiki, at Jack Flyn, at Blair's Menagerie. We love your feedback. If there's a topic you would like us to cover or address a suggestion for an interview, please let us know. <laughs> we'll be back here next week. We hope you'll join us again for more great science news. And if you learned anything from the show, remember... <laughs> It's all in your head. This week in science. This week in science. This week in science. This week in science is the end of the world. So I'm setting up shop. Got my banner unfurled. It says the scientist is in. I'm gonna sell my advice. Show them how to stop the robots with a simple device. I'll reverse global warming with a wave of my hand. And all it'll cost you is a couple of grand. Science is coming your way, so everybody listen to what I say. I use the scientific method for all that it's worth, and I'll broadcast my opinion all over the earth.
it's this week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 This week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 I've got one disclaimer, and it shouldn't be news. That what I say may not represent your views, but I've done the calculations and I've got a plan. If you listen to the science, you may just end up. You may just not understand. Are you paradolying us? Yes, I have one more to show you. Okay. <laughs> it's way too much fun. Uh, uh, Paradolia. Oh, yeah. Is this, a, this is my yeah. favorite one. <laughs> Look at him. <laughs> <laughs> so one of my favorite uh Google, not Google, Facebook groups is googly eyes in strange places. Yes. Because people take googly eyes and they stick them on all sorts of things. And so it's a very similar concept. It's just you put eyes Some on Some people something. we know personally like to do that. <laughs> yes. I'm sure they're not watching right now. No, not at all. Not at all. They're probably enjoying a nice glass of wine from a bottle with googly eyes on it. <laughs> <laughs> probably you know who you are yeah so the man in the moon what is it the face on mars yeah i think uh the bad astronomer phil plate he has a whole like funny presentation about like it's not faces um but male anatomy being seen the oh. pareidolia <laughs> very good very good <laughs> in space so it's like a, it's a really funny. Look at this one. <laughs> These guys are mad. You know, so I just have to wonder something like that, the the top left speaker kind of thing. Yeah. They did that on purpose, right? They do. P engineers have to do that on purpose, right? This one also designers. seems intentional. This it's is like, like I'm going to make a cute face. <laughs> I'm going to put a face on it. <laughs> It reminds me of here. I'm gonna stop sharing. I'm always afraid to share my screen while I Google. Um, yeah, yeah. Don't share your screen while you Google. The mouse is a bird. Yes, about... Twitter feed faces in things. <laughs> it's funny. Reddit has great stuff like this. There's some really good sources for this kind of entertainment. Uh, I was thinking about yes intention but actually Cody yes so um especially seeing faces uh the human brain has a, a predisposition to see faces in things yes oh what's his name Bemo, Bemo. yeah cute Bemo he's yeah. so nice mm -hmm. but Bemo has a face in his face he That's does nice. He does. Face. Bimo's adorable. He I just like has a very Bimo. simple face. Is the thing. I think that's what I was thinking about. Is that like his face is so simple, but it's still undeniably a face. And it's, it's because we do that, right? Right. And so we have this. Our brain is like, I would like to see faces. We like faces. Faces are important to us because that's potentially friend or foe or predator. Faces yeah, are. Are part of recognizing type of coat my hanger brain cells. Yeah, is it specific kind of coat hanger that always looks like a an octopus that wants to to fight me? Now I have to find a picture of this thing. Drunk octopus it, wants to fight you. Right, is what you're talking about. <laughs> Here, is he has he been drinking? Yeah, because his eyes are lopsided. <laughs> <laughs> Poor octopus. Um, yeah. Here we go. Here we go. To me, this is like there we go. There one go. of the best examples. Oh, oh. Of oh, there we go. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's like yeah. That's it. To fight. That's like one of the best <laughs> examples <laughs> of that sort of. What do you? What do you and call then you it? see it's not it. Anthropomorphizing. What is it? What's the word for the... It's called pa pareidolia. 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 That we were talking about. Oh, wait. Hold on. Here's There's one that somebody... Um... <sighs> okay. 
one I got to share here. Uh, logo. Fada is signing off. See you next week, Fada. Night, Fada. Okay. Um, come on. I just want to see this image all by itself. There we are. Okay. Um, it's not necessarily pareidolia, but it's a very similar uh, concept to it of just seeing things in a particular way. Colonel Sanders' tie. Mm -hmm. It's like his little stick figure. <laughs> Isn't it? His head is on a little stick figure body. <laughs> <That's> wait, <only. laughs> wait, you mean it's not? You're never going to not see this again. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> How is that boy. even a tie? That's not a tie. It it's, a... Like a little, it's like a little body yeah. and he's got this big head. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it's his little, his little Colonel Sanders tie, you know? Oh. Yeah, the, the the southern gentleman tie. Yes, the southern southern gentleman. Oh, Schnago just shared a good one in the chat in the uh, Discord. Oh, and everybody, if you are uh, supporting us on Patreon, you can be in our Discord. Mm -hmm. So that's something you can do if you wanted to be in the Discord. Yes, identity for circles, emojis are a great example of it. The simpleness. Thank you, OO, -oh, not not, a bolo. And as an example, bolo. okay, so in an example, the it's it's kind of you know it's like a southern southern gentleman. No, but the two the two O's zeros O's in this username, they look like eyeballs. Wait, mm -hmm. we're not seeing it. I'm seeing. I'm just seeing KFC still. No, on the bottom part of the screen, you can't see it. Lower third, the, bottom corner, the, right the, underneath Justin. Oh, there. Okay, yeah. I see it. I see it. I see it. Okay. Like, where? What am I doing? Stick figure. I know. Oh, yes. Oh, Colonel. My spubbies. Colonel stick the figure. <laughs> I can never not see it now. His cute little tie. Oh, Colonel. He's not really a full-grown man. He's just a stick figure with a giant head. <laughs> so let's see, Blair, you had a fancy getaway. Uh-huh. 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 Great um, times. Great times yeah, in the I Big Yeah, I went easy. to the Big Easy, indeed. Mm -hmm. I went for a wedding that was supposed to happen April 5th, 2020. So it finally occurred. <laughs> so that awesome. was nice. Um, and then I stayed because I love New Orleans. Uh, some extra days because it combines my favorite things delicious seafood um and jazz <laughs> and beignets and also and beignets and also alligators <laughs> and alligators i may yeah. have bought several things with alligators on them um uh, i can't help <laughs> is it. that your new thing now is that what we're buying you now things with alligators no i mean alligators are always good <laughs> they've always been good they were actually my favorite um outreach animal for a long time they're my favorite animal to use in zoo education programs were because they ate the children no because they're a success story of conservation actually that's <laughs> why it's the real answer <laughs> they're also just really fun to handle they're so cute and kids get such baby alligators, right? Yeah. They get such a yeah. kick out of them. You get to keep them until they're like three or four. So mm. they, um, American alligators almost went extinct. Um, yeah. And we brought them back. And as part of it is, is an ultimate success story. Part of it is that they're like a predator. So they took back the neighborhood really easily when we reintroduced them. Um, but uh, the buy is really interesting because not only that, but we almost ended up with American hippos. <laughs> right. So uh, we went to the Audubon Zoo one day, which is an excellent zoo. It's an excellent zoo because like a third of the zoo is a swamp exhibit. So hmm. you really get to kind of like immerse yourself in the um, ecological history of the space you're in, which I just, I love when a zoo does that. And so they had a whole, um, little bit talking about the water hyacinth, which is a, um, an invasive species invasive. That exploded yeah. in the bayou. And so they, they were one vote shy, one vote 
in Congress shy of introducing hippopotamuses into the American South to get rid of the the hyacinth to eat the hyacinth. Talk about like dodging a bullet. Well, aren't they in uh, Central and South America? Isn't that the... Yes, because of the the drug cartel <laughs> bosses that had them, and then it was a... Yeah. Then there was like a storm or something, and they escaped. I don't know. I don't, yeah. They're down there. <laughs> it's a whole yeah. thing. So you are, you are currently showing the difference between alligators and crocodiles. So yes, side view... I think that's interesting. Side views... Uh, pretty easy to tell if you can get close enough to see teeth because alligators you only see the top teeth and crocodiles it's like a zipper you see top and bottom and the easy way to remember that is that this makes the shape of an a so just the top teeth make the shape of an a for alligator Uh but the easiest way to tell is actually if you look from above which is what you're about to click on alligators have a big fat snout they're much more rounded and crocodiles have this like more skinny lumpy crinkly looking snout um crocodiles generally speaking can also get way bigger and um alligators are freshwater animals and crocodiles can do fresh or salt but they are usually salt Mm. so there's a bunch of differences if your crocodiles have been around longer uh evolutionarily that would make sense there's only two species of alligator on the planet and there's a lot more crocodiles yeah. So um, there's only the American and the Chinese alligator. Those are the only kind mm. that we still have. Um, but uh, yeah, so if you're in the South, you're, you usually see alligators. <laughs> That's usually the deal. So Yeah, I love them. They're so cool. This guy little looks like a puppy. Predators. Like, yeah. This, this little image, his little eyes. It's like, oh, you're just a leather, you're just, you know, just a leathery, scaly puppy. Look at that. We could train you not to eat me. No. no. You play fetch with an alligator. No. No. <laughs> no. 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 I had a okay. children's book growing up about uh, someone raising an alligator in their tub. Yeah. No, that's a poor idea. Also. <sighs> People do it though, right? They because uh, probably in the south, right? It's the oh, Zach's Indian. alligator. There it is, man. I I definitely read that book. Wow. Did it make you want to get a bath alligator? Yes. <laughs> See, that's that's not good. <laughs> oh, what's the what's the albino alligator? Uh, the, Cal- the uh, California Claude. Academy of Sciences. Yeah, Claude. Claude. They had they yeah. had two albino alligators at uh, the Audubon Zoo. Although none of them, are, to my knowledge, are actually albino. They're all leucistic, so it's a misnomer. Who? Yeah. So uh, they're actually uh, the difference is that they have some pigment. So like one of the white alligators at the Audubon Zoo had like splotches of color on his face. It's pretty cool. So. Mm-hmm. Splatches. He had splotches. He was very splatches, cute. Splatches, little splotches. Oh, Zach's alligator was named Bridget. Oh, oh yeah, there she is. Here, You're looking at things. Share. Share. I'm going to show. We took a, a trip to Cal Academy specifically to go visit Claude because I guess uh-huh. the, there's Claude has a, a children's book. And uh-huh. it got it got read in my uh, my daughter's class, Ooh. and then she, and then I was like, "That's Cal Academy. That's you know, we can just go drive there, like right now. We could go see Claude for real." And so it was on. We, we jumped in the in the car and, and drove down to Cute. to go say hi. Yeah. Uh, I probably read that book too, Blair. Um, so this, yeah, so, it, so familiar. the alligator starts, this is the thing that's crazy is the alligator starts really small. Mm-hmm. Um, she starts out so small. Did she's, alligators uh, grow? She's, uh, she's the little keychain. <sighs> yeah. And she, oh. um, she jingles Wild around. Crocodiles turning up in Florida. What? Everything shows up in Florida. She shows around in, or she shows up in the change pocket. 
<laughs> he is just napping in his pocket. Aww. Yeah, Cuz that's where baby alligators go. Yeah. Not not a great lesson to be learned. No. But that's okay. It's a kid's book. I'll cut it some, some slack. Yes. How's the Bambinino, Justin? Oh, he's great. Good. He's good. That's fantastic. Well, I'm gonna, I think, go to bed. We're very quiet yeah. this evening. Yeah. We're not we're not arguing about things. We're not debating things. What? We're not <laughs> I'm still what? adjusting to being diurnal again. What? We're very quiet. Yeah. We're a quiet yeah. bunch. We have New some Orleans, good... you gotta you gotta be up so late if you wanna really enjoy the music. And I yeah. like almost completely switched to being nocturnal. Oh wow! <laughs> and Brian's like, "This is no problem." Yeah, Brian's <laughs> like, "I do this every week. <laughs> this is easy." Switch so nocturnal to diurnal, diurnal to nocturnal is easy as pie. I'm like, I can't do it. <laughs> yeah, I'm bad at it too. I, it's <sighs> no good. Yeah. yeah. Oh my gosh! Identity Four says oh, when they were in college, the folks in the dorm next to me had a pet alligator in their room. Mm -mm. What? No, thank That's, you. Did who did I just have to know? Like, did somebody come and say you got to get rid of the alligator? Like, I think that depends where you went to school. <laughs> Alligators in dorms? What? Yeah. Oh, what? Oh, what? Oh, what? Everybody That's leave the wild there. animals yeah. in the wild places, okay? Okay. Bozeman, <laughs> Montana. <laughs> That was unexpected. Thank you for that punchline. Uh, and is that is uh, ancestral the territory for the American alligator? Yeah, all right. Ancestral there were, there were, for the crocodile. For there were uh, alligators in uh, Montana once upon a time. That was their native habitat. <laughs> the RA was okay with it for some reason, <laughs> as an aquatic pet. Oh, that's great. Okie doke. Right. Okay, but let's teach those RAs no alligators in the bathroom. They're just also kids. Uh, although true. while we're on this, uh, you can responsibility. Uh, Google this on the on the on the what do you call it? The YouTube's. What uh, are you recommending? Pet lobster. There's a this is an amazing video of somebody who went to a store and purchased a live lobster and then brought it home and put it in an aquarium and kept it as a pet and it is it is uh, it's, it's a heartwarming story and and lobsters are amazing intelligent uh creature i mean this thing is uh mm -hmm. coming up to, to feed when he's uh, playing you know playing with them a little bit and uh cleaning constantly cleaning its yeah. aquarium and like shuffling the debris to one side it's got like the trash area that it puts all the the refuse in the, uh and then priming and uh just just an amazing so go find i don't know what it's called exactly but there's a pet lobster it's a rescued rescued from a store just bought just went to the grocery store and bought a live lobster to go and put it in its aquarium to, to see what all happened and live lobster had to nurse it back to health because uh, the poor claw was from having the rubber band oh, on it. So yeah. It couldn't work at first. And... It was atrophied muscles. Yeah. And he, he put it through rehab and uh, kept this. And it's just, it's a great story. So, so it's, I wouldn't say don't keep any uh, creatures about this. Go, everybody, after what, go watch the video. Just get trained. And then go get. <laughs> <laughs> Go rescue a lobster from your local uh, grocery store. Has to be a live one. Uh, that's a caveat. But yeah, no, it's a like not a dead lobster. Yeah. No, that one. That story ended. Uh, <laughs> somebody else tried that. <laughs> Didn't understand the concept. Uh, Let but, me yeah, see no, your I lobster learned. roll. Lobster coming. roll. What? <clears throat> All right. Uh, next week. So I'll see many. Us. Yeah, I was just going to say so many animals are smart, are intelligent in various ways. I would not have thought uh, that a lobster would have uh, had better housekeeping 
uh, skills and, and instincts than, than myself, but it definitely does. Yep. So smart and such a fascinating creature. And I've never really looked at a lobster. Yeah, I'm always like, kinda, like when they got the live lobsters in there, I'm always just sort of like, I don't want to see like a live thing waiting for mm -hmm. to be, you know, boiled alive. And like, I don't, it's just something terrible to me about the live lobster pen. Uh, it's like a death row in the grocery it store. It is. It's it such is. a weird such a weird thing but that's such an amazing creature sadie ah that's the cutest puppy hi sadie she came hi, in to get sadie. me she was like excuse me hi, hi sadie <laughs> what are hi. you doing i want to be in your lap hi sadie hi sadie you're cute hi <laughs> she's like i don't know she likes this. to be held like this like a human that's <laughs> funny she's like i want to be in your face I'm going to be right here. Oh, she says it's bedtime, Blair. Yeah. Say good night, Blair. Bedtime. Good night, Blair. Say good morning, Justin. Good morning, Justin. Oh, good, good night, Kiki. Kiki. Good night, everyone. Thank you for joining us for yet another episode of This Week in Science. And we do hope that you will join us again next week. But in the meantime, stay well. Stay happy if you can. I don't know. Stay calm. Don't get overexcited. Um, <laughs> listen to your heartbeat. Listen beat. to your heartbeat. Stay connected to humanity with kindness and compassion. And stay curious. We will see you again next Wednesday. Ciao.